over the course of this series, we've said that we're all designed to want. We all have desires, and as a result, we pursue pleasure to no end. And we think we know what we want, we think we know what will lead us to satisfaction, and we pursue all kinds of things with the hope that a different guy, a different body, uh, a different outfit will give us what we really want. But in reality, we don't know what we want at all. Therefore, our lives become shaped by our desires and by what satisfies us. And when we find it, we lock into it like a hound dog and we will pursue it at any cost. And this involves far more than just a pursuit of pleasure. It demands our emotions, our time, and our allegiance. Ultimately, whatever we desire captures our affections and our worship. Because in reality, our desires control our worship. That is why I could follow you around for a week and tell you exactly what it is that you desire. Because in the same way that a horse pulls a carriage, we are pulled through life by our desires. It's why many of you can't stop texting your boyfriend or girlfriend right now because that person is the most satisfying thing in your life. And in the process, more than just your desires are captured. That guy or that girl becomes your self-worth. He or she captures your affections. That relationship is where you have found your pleasure. And as our desires go, so go the rest of our lives. And in the same way, it is why so many of us spend so many hours trying to perfect our batting swing or our tumbling pass. It's because the acknowledgement of a coach or the starting position you've gained or how everyone notices you satisfies you so much. It now dictates your schedule and everything about you. Because where our satisfactions lie, there lies our affections in our lives. It's not just a desire problem. It goes beyond that. Because we worship what we desire the most. Therefore, it becomes a worship problem. Because we desire the wrong thing, ultimately we will worship the wrong thing. And eventually, our lives will be tailored around those things and we will worship what it is that we desire the most. Now, when God made us to pursue satisfaction, when He stamped on our DNA the ability to be satisfied, He also instilled in us the ability to worship what we desire the most. So as we sit here desiring sex, desiring our boyfriends or girlfriends, desiring to look a certain way more than anything else in the world, we unknowingly allow that desire to transform us into guys or girls who become fully devoted worshipers of that desire. You know what is crazy about all of this is that God equipped you and me with a desire to worship. Now, I know many of you uh, sitting here today will be saying to yourself, how does this worship fit into all of this? Well, here's how. Worship is a demonstration of your reverent love and devotion to a deity, an idol, or a sacred object. Therefore, if you love an object or thing so much that it would bring pain to your life without it, you basically are a worshiper. Now I'm sure many of you are saying, I'm not a worshiper of any of my desires. I don't raise my hands or close my eyes and sing out loud to my desire. And to be honest with you, I know you don't. But your actions and your intense focus of that desire says otherwise. Think about it this way. Just go to any college football game in the fall. You will see 50-year-old men barking, children with their faces painted, or women screaming at the top of their lungs for the team or player they love so much. See, that is what worship is all about, showing reverent love and devotion toward an object or deity. Therefore, the greatest worship in the country doesn't happen in the churches. It happens on the college campuses. Why? Because it is what the fans desire. It's what they live for, to see their team win. And when they do, it is so satisfying. I mean, they drive hundreds of miles for it. To, they make up songs and chants for their teams like, oh, 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 go Knowles. I mean, you see what I mean? As our desires go, so go our affections. And thus, worshipers are created. It's the human condition, and we can't stop it. When we delight in something, it grabs us at our hearts. That's why girls cry out when they see Justin Bieber. It's why guys go crazy when they see Megan Fox. We are the outcome of our desires. And the truth is, your life is poured out and wrapped around your desire. And too many times I've seen students allow that passionate desire cause them to make stupid or unwise choices. Therefore, we're going to look at a guy today who has been there, who decided to worship his desire. And this guy thought he really had something. 
It was what he desired, and he bowed down to it. And so we're going to pick up today in Isaiah chapter 44, verse 14. Listen to what it says starting there. He cuts down cedars. He selects the cypress and the oak. He plants the pine in the forest to be nourished by the rain. Then he uses part of the wood to make the fire. With it, he warms himself and bakes his bread. Then, yes, it's true, he takes the rest of it and makes himself a god to worship. He makes an idol and bows down in front of it. Wow, did you see that? This guy took his desire, his means of satisfaction, the expensive and profitable cypress and oak trees, and he worshiped it. And in verse 17, the guy in Isaiah says, save me, you are my God. He decided to let his desire and satisfaction lead him to worshiping an object. Maybe for you, it is some of the things that we talked about last week. You are obsessed with your appearance, your schoolwork, the stuff you buy, or maybe even a sexual relationship. And in the process of desiring those things, ultimately they have captured your worship. It's not just that you delight in your appearance. In reality, you worship you. It's not just that sex is a little teenage experimentation. It is that all of your affections have aligned with it. It is not just that you buy thing after thing. It's that you bow down to it. And because of our desires for satisfaction, we will do whatever it takes to get what we want. Isaiah says, I will do you one better. It becomes your God. We may never take an actual knee to it or raise our hands in praise of it, but it is our pleasure, and thus it becomes our God with a little g. Let me illustrate it, Let me illustrate it this way. If your dad or mom woke you up in the morning uh, tomorrow and said, bad news, I made some poor investments and choices in life. The lake house, it's gone. We have to sell your car and from now on, we can only buy your clothes from Walmart. You'd lose it. And that single response demonstrates that our desires and the things that will bring us satisfaction really do matter. Now, there's a positive side to this idea of finding satisfaction from the things that we desire. And I want us to, to now look at what the psalmist says in Psalm 34, 8. Taste and see that the Lord is good. See, in this passage, the invitation of Scripture is to come and really be satisfied. See, the psalmist is saying we need to have a desire. We need to be satisfied. But the difference is that our desires and our satisfaction have been in the things that really don't matter. And I would say that they're all surface level things. And that if all we desire are what brings us satisfaction, our desires are minuscule. They're too small. And here's what I mean by that. If you're addicted or obsessed to things that really don't matter, in reality, you are too easily pleased. Therefore, when what we desire is too little, when desire is shortened, we will bow down to something really small. But if we see it for what it really is, and we see the invitation that pulls us, we will desire much, and we will worship the one who is much. Listen to what Jesus says about our desires for much. If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. See, Jesus is saying, come to me and I will fulfill the thing that you truly desire. I will give you what will really satisfy you. And that is the truth that we must understand and own if we are going to find fulfillment and be able to make the wise choice in life. So, as we close, we're not saying it's wrong to play sports or to work out or to work hard in school. The problem comes in when our desire is so small that we desire those things more than God and in the process our worship and our lives are given to those things. God created you to desire and He created you to pursue satisfaction. He made you to make a God out of whatever you find pleasure in. And the moment we see it, the moment where our spiritual eyes are opened up, when we really see that there is a Heavenly Father who holds out His hand to meet our desires, that is the moment where our desires shift and we walk right into the heart of following Christ. The moment where we desire much is when we worship much. And doing this puts God at the center of our desires, our satisfaction, and our worship.